If you have a paper Bible or if you have a digital Bible, turn with me to Acts chapter 16. We're going to continue in our series, Empowered, today, a study out of the book of Acts. And uh, I'm jumping way ahead to to, uh, chapter 16, and I'm really excited about what's going to happen today because God wants to change our lives, and everybody said amen. If you don't have a Bible, this will be on the screens as well, but I want to read. This is a pretty good passage of Scripture. Starting in verse 16, we're going to read a story together, so let's go in. The writer of Acts says this, As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are, men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. And Paul, I love this part right here, Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. And the crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Verse 25 is our key scripture today. And it says, About midnight, everyone say about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. And when the jailer woke and saw the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, don't harm yourself, we're all here. And the jailer called for the lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Come on, are you grateful for the word of God today? I want to remind you, this story is not mythology. This is historical fact, and the power of God was released in this situation. That's what we're going to look at today. Let's pray, and then we're going to uh, go into this and dive a little deeper. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Jesus, that this is your character, your nature, your words, your heart, your mind on paper for us to see today. And so we don't simply come uh, to any of our locations and here in Vacaville just to hear a motivational speech. We're not just hearing food for thought, but Lord, we receive by faith the word of God today. Would you just pray that over your own heart right now? Say, God, help me to receive by faith the word of God. The Lord, it's not just a speech today. It's not just someone's talk that they put together. But Lord, we receive from the spirit of God. Speak to us and change us in the name of Jesus. And if you're up for that, say amen. 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 So man, what an amazing story, right? Paul and Silas going around, doing the will of God, doing what God's called them to do, and out of nowhere, their situation changes, and they're wrongfully imprisoned, and then we see this this situation that they're in, and it says about midnight, they were praying and singing hymns to God. So I just want to set the scene for you uh, really quick here, because the inner prison, it says that the jailer put them in the inner prison, and in those days, uh, there was like a vestibule, an outer prison that was, you know, kind of your overnight jail situation, but the inner prison was like solitary confinement. And uh, you dig into the, the historicity of this, if that's even a word, it sounded great when I said it. Uh, you dig into that and, and it's actually completely dark, no moving air. Uh, they were in the depths of the prison. In fact, the very place that the sewage of the city would run through the prison uh, on its way to where, however they would handle that. That's where Paul and Silas were. So imagine their mindset, imagine their emotion saying, God, we were doing what you called us to do. And all of a sudden we were flogged, beaten, thrown in solitary confinement, 
And now we're fastened in stocks. And the stocks were, you know, you've probably seen it in different movies or whatever, but it was, you know, these wooden structures that had five holes, two for your legs, two for your arms, and one for your neck. Uh, not a very comfortable position to be in. This was a, a torture device that they would use uh, in those days. And so they were beaten and flogged and now tortured and put in the most horrible situation that you could be in, all for doing the will of God. And it says that uh, about midnight, they were singing hymns to God. Now, I don't want to insult anyone's intelligence, but I need to, to remind us, the hymns they were singing wasn't like Amazing Grace. Okay, that was written quite a few years later. Uh, biblically, the term hymns means it's, it's a man-written song. So there were psalms that they would sing that were actually the psalms, and then hymns were songs that others had, had written themselves. And so uh, many uh, uh, theologians believe these could have actually been the psalms that they were singing because those were written by David, all right? And so this is the scene. This is the setting that they're in here. And uh, the other thing is this, is that this isn't the first prison that the apostles had been thrown in wrongfully by people that were intimidated by the advancement of the gospel and uh, in whatever situations the, that they were in. in. In Acts chapter five, we see that the apostles were thrown in prison, but God broke them out. In Acts chapter 12, Peter was thrown in prison for preaching the gospel, and it says that the church was praying and God sent an angel and broke Peter out of prison. And so God showed that the prayers of the saints are powerful to unlock prisons and, and break chains off of people. And now in Acts chapter 16, the third time we see apostles wrongfully imprisoned, and God shows us the power of our praise to break us out of horrible situations, to break chains off of our lives, and to affect more than us. Let me ask you a question today at all of our, all of our locations and, and here in this room. What do you do when you're living life and all of a sudden you find yourself in a prison season? What do you do when you've, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, you're do, doing what's honorable, you're doing what God's called you to do, and seemingly for no reason you end up in a prison, you end up beat up and in chains, and you, are, you feel in one way, shape, or form enslaved in life? What's your go-to? So what do, what do I mean by that? I just want to bring it home. What, if, what do you do when a relationship goes sideways? When all of a sudden someone who's a best friend or a spouse or whatever it could be, another relative, all of a sudden something just goes wrong and this relationship that you used to have that was close is now broken and torn and you have no idea what's going on. Or maybe you uh, get hit by multiple financial blows at once. I mean, you know what that's like when you think you're doing good and you're living by God's principles and all of a sudden this happens and then this happens and then this happens and you're like, God, what in the world? Now I'm drowning in debt and I was trying to honor you with my finances and you have these blows, right? Or how about this prison? You, you receive a diagnosis out of nowhere. How many of you have felt that before? When you're just living your life and then all of a sudden, I did not see myself being here, and now you're in this prison of fear and torment and anguish and the what ifs, and we'll talk more about that. Or maybe you're just living life and then you, you come under spiritual attack. And for no reason, you just feel this opposition in your life, you feel fear and torment in the night, uh, and, and, and something's just happening. You're living your life and out of nowhere, you end up in chains. And everything changes in one moment, you're like, God, what happened? God, what happened? It feels like you're sitting in those stocks, bloodied and beaten, and so what do you do? So many people you know, around us, and even in church, uh, if you're not you know, farther in your walk with God or you're not in a strong place, you can escape into things when you're in a prison season, right? You can escape into substances. You can escape into relationships that are not healthy. You can escape into uh, you know, alcohol or substances or pornography or uh, sexual addictions is so, so common, so prevalent. And what we've seen even the last several years in our nation is so many people escaping, just trying to make it through because collectively as a society, we've ended up in a prison season. But God wants us to wake up today and see the real uh, situation as it is and, and see the power that he wants to give us through looking at this story in Acts 16. But the good news is this, there is another way to respond. You don't have to escape, you don't have to medicate, you don't have to fall into destructive behaviors, you can do it God's way and that's what we're gonna look at today. No matter what your situation is, you can respond in a way that results in breakthrough for your mind, your spirit, your situation and your life. And so in Acts 16, we see the response of faith-filled people to a situation that is very wrong and they didn't deserve to be in. And the response of Paul and Silas is a key that every one of us should know, embody, and employ 
in any prison season of our lives. And let me put it like this, I, I truly believe this. Unless you learn the lesson that we're gonna look at today, I believe that you cannot live the life of a believer that God has for you to live. This is such a key principle for our lives. It was a key principle in my life. When I first read this scripture and I said, wait, is that real? That seems a little bit too fairy tale to be true. But then through my life, I've seen God use the tool of praise to do significant things in my life, to break through situations that would be so easy just to sit in, but instead I'm an overcomer in God, as the Bible says, because of these principles that he puts in his word. And so here's the main point of today. I want you to get this, write this in your phone, write it on your neighbor's head, whatever you need to do. I need you to get this, ready? This is coming up on the screen. Praise is a choice. It isn't something you wait for, it's something you do. Praise isn't just a song you sing, but a weapon you wield. Can we read this together? This is so important. If you get this, like not just remember it, but if you live this, it will completely change your life as a believer. Let's read this together again. Praise is a choice. It isn't something you wait for, it's something you do. Praise isn't just a song you sing, but a weapon you wield. Now, what do you mean a weapon that you wield? Well, Pastor Dave started to talk about this last week a little bit. I want to read this scripture. 2 Corinthians 10.4 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Now, I was thinking about this as I was researching this and studying the word and studying the situation, and just a kind of a cool thought here. Paul's the one that wrote 2 Corinthians 10.4, and he said, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty for the pulling down of strongholds. I believe that when he wrote that verse, instantly he was transported back to being in the prison with Silas. And he remembers, man, we got in prison for something that was so wrong, it wasn't our fault, we were following the will of God, we were sitting in stocks, but about midnight, we were singing hymns to God, and an earthquake shook that prison, and literally I heard the sound of chains snapping off the walls, and our stocks falling off of our feet, and our hands, and our necks. It, it wasn't just this nice thought. Paul said, no, 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 Corinthian church, I need you to get it, that the weapons of our warfare are mighty for the pulling down of strongholds. Like I saw it happen, I was in the inner prison and there was freedom that came and the earthquake came and it shook the entire prison and all the doors opened and the chains broke off and the stocks broke off. The weapons of our warfare are mighty through God for pulling down strongholds. And I, I, I love, I forget where I heard this, but we have to remember the Bible was written for you but it wasn't written to you. He was talking to the Corinthian church and the situation that they were in, but thank God the Bible was written for us because today, even though we aren't chained up, we're not in stocks maybe, uh, those of you that have invested in stocks feel like you're in a prison, but <laughs> I digress. But the weapons of your warfare, they don't look like the weapons that the world fights with, but they are mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. And your praise is not just a song you sing, it is a weapon that you wield. So Paul was in literal chains, but what are the chains that might be holding you back today? How about wrong relationships, addictions? How about this one, apathy? If the enemy can get you just sitting and doing nothing, he wins. If the enemy can get you in a sluggish state in your spirit, then he can beat your family up, he can beat your city up, he can beat your state up, and you're just sitting back while it's happening. He loves to have us in the chains of apathy. How about spiritual strongholds? Maybe over the last several years you've dabbled in some things or watched some entertainment that you never watched before and it's opened a door into your life and into your spirit. Now it's affecting your dreams, it's affecting your attitudes. This is how it happens. And these are the chains that hold us back and we feel weighed down all of a sudden. Or how about this? Wrong doctrine or wrong thoughts about God. These are some serious chains in these days. Is God really sovereign? Is God really over all? I don't know, I see something different with my eyes, but you know, the Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight. And so I'm just here to wake us up again today and say we don't walk by what we see, church. We get back to the word of God, the living word, which is active and it will change your life. And so these are the chains and, and fear and torment and anxiety. I love uh, because there's freedom, but how many stories we hear during baptism of people that were riddled with anxiety and fear and torment. 
but they're freed by the power of God. But these are the chains. It's anything that holds you back from living the life that God has for you in freedom. And just a real quick plug here, we've got an event coming up that we do several times a year uh, called our Life Change Event. And I wanna just give this to you. I encourage you, if you've not, never been through Life Change, Nothing has been more well-branded than this one. It is life-changing, and uh, those who have been through it, you can vouch for that. I'm, this is the most powerful thing we do as a church in two days, and here's what it is. We encounter Jesus in a new way. We allow him to speak into our lives and reveal things that are chains we maybe didn't even know that we had that are holding us back, and then we end by being empowered by the power of the Holy Spirit to live a godly life for the future. So if you've never been through Life Changed, you can sign up for that on the app or on the website, but that is what it's all about. And um, back to our, our, our story here, Isaiah 61, I wanna read this to you. This is prophetic of Jesus, but Isaiah 61, one says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to console those who mourn in Zion, and get this, to give them the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Whew, how many of you guys have ever felt the spirit of heaviness come on before? I know I have. I think if we're honest with ourselves, I mean, like, it's like out of nowhere, and it's like this lead blanket just comes on your life, and you're just like, why do I feel like this? But Jesus says that God has anointed him through the Holy Spirit to give us a garment of praise instead of a spirit of heaviness. So I wanna tell you today, don't wear heaviness put on praise. I don't know if you've ever sensed this. I know this for myself. I've said, when I feel that start to happen, I say, no, I'm not giving a place for heaviness in my life right now. And whether I'm in my car or I'm in a, you know, wherever I'm at, maybe underneath my breath, I just start to lift up praise. Because guess what happens? Praise repels heaviness. Heaviness can't hang around where praise is being employed by spirit-filled, faith-filled believers. It is a principle of the kingdom. If we can learn this today, church, here's the deal. I believe that maturity is this. It's not letting heaviness hang around any longer than it should. Because in our frailty sometimes, when heaviness starts to set in, we just go, oh, here we go again. Oh, I felt this before. Oh, I know this feeling. Oh, good thing I have medication. I'm talking about pills. I'm talking about anything that we medicate our lives with. But no, God is saying, put on the garment of praise instead of a spirit of heaviness, because that's how breakthrough comes. Look at this, Psalm 22, three. Here's what happens when we put on praise instead of heaviness. Uh, the psalmist says this, you are holy, speaking of God, enthroned on the praises of Israel, or enthroned on the praises of your people. This is a life verse for me, why? When we lift up praise to God, he's enthroned upon that praise. Now, when there's a presidential election, and a new president is set in, don't worry about January 6th, but the, when a new president is set in, what happens to the old president's power? It's gone. When God is enthroned in your life or in a situation, his power is established and the power of whatever else was on that throne is eradicated, it is gone. And so I'm here to tell you today, maybe there is that fear or that torment that comes upon you in the night, praise God. When you praise him, his, his power comes and it is established and that thing is kicked off the throne. Now I get it, it's not always instantaneous. Even in this story in Acts 16, it says that about midnight they were praying. It doesn't say about midnight they started praying or started worshiping. I believe there is times where God does something in an instant, but there's other times where we have to persevere in our praise and persevere in our praise. And Joseph, I've been doing this lesson for a couple days now, and I, and I feel, I still feel pretty heavy. It's like, don't worry, you are chiseling away at that thing, and the power of God is being enthroned in your situation. It's real, and it works, and I've seen it in my life. Praise affects your everyday life. I, uh, several years ago, when our, our second son was born, a week later, uh, my wife hemorrhaged and uh, was bleeding out. And I rushed her to the hospital because it was faster. We were, lived close enough. I took her to the hospital, and uh, I remember wheeling her into the ER and just kind of freaking out. I had a one-week-old baby, a two-year-old son, and I'm like, what is happening? And I won't go through all the details because uh, I don't want to scare you, and those who are squeamish might respond in other ways. But she lost a third of her blood supply in the ER. So she was rushed into emergency surgery and I was just really concerned for my son, obviously concerned for my wife, and um, I was just like, okay, what, what's happening here? I don't think because of the shock, it didn't hit me how serious the situation was. And so as they're wheeling her out to go to the OR, uh, I asked the doctor, I said, okay, if this is routine, 
how long should this take? She said, it'll be 30 minutes. And then she worked me through the other scenarios that could happen. And, but if this is routine and if it's all good, 30 minutes. And I said, okay, cool. And, uh, you know, back, this is 10 years ago, uh, the, the hospital wasn't at full function yet. And so the only place they had for me to wait was in the ICU waiting room. And uh, it was summer, so I'm wearing flip-flops and, and shorts and a tank top. It was hot, but in the hospital it was freezing, and especially uh, at night. And so I find myself in the ICU waiting room at about midnight. No joke. And I'm by myself, and there's not a lot of activity in the hospital. And 30 minutes, nothing. An hour, nothing. I start looking around the room and it's like grief counseling, what to do in death, all the resources you give people whose loved ones are not in a very good situation. And I'm by myself at about midnight, and an hour turns into an hour and a half, nothing. An hour and a half turns into two hours, nothing. Now I'm freaking out. What started as like, oh, okay, it's going to be all good. She's in good hands. No information. Now it's four times as long as they said it was going to be. And I start running scenarios in my head. How do I raise two boys alone? What do I do in this situation? And I know so many of you have been in your own form of this story that I'm talking about. And there was a spirit of fear that came into that ICU waiting room. And luckily, I smelled it. Like, not literally, but I, <laughs> you can smell it. People have <laughs> been around long enough, you've smelled some demonic stuff. But I recognized it. God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a spirit of peace, love, and a sound mind. So fear, I know, is not from him. And when it comes in heavy, it was easy to, to recognize it. So what did I do? Frail and uh, not wanting to disrupt the whole hospital, under my breath, I just start, God, I just give you praise. God, I praise you. God, you're good. And I start ignoring the situation. It's not like, God, you're good even if. No, just God, you're good. God, you are enthroned on the praise of your people. God, I exalt you. God, you're worthy of our lives. God, whatever happens, I give you everything. I give you my family, Lord. You are so worthy. You are so good. You are so to be honored. And as I did that, fear started to lift in that room. And my atmosphere changed. And two and a half hours into this, I finally get word that she was out and everything was all good and she was in recovery and and she's here to tell the story, thank God. So what is that for you? You know that situation. You know heaviness. Praise affects real life. God doesn't put us in those prison seasons, but he'll use those to teach us lessons and teach people around us lessons and help us to see the power of God. Remember our main point today, praise is a choice. Praise isn't something we wait for, it's something we do. Praise is not just songs that we sing, but it is a weapon that we wield. If I didn't understand this principle, I would be in a far different place. I don't know if I would be where I'm at today. I'd probably be riddled in depression. I'd probably be riddled in heaviness and fear and anxiety. And I'm not saying if you're dealing with those things that you're in the wrong. Things, there's a lot there, and we're holistic thinkers. Not, not everything is spiritual, and not everything is just physical either. But what I'm saying is this, is that when you understand that praise is a weapon, you can fight back against the schemes of the enemy, and when you find yourself in chains and in socks in prison, you have a weapon that you can use to break out. Quick thought here, I think that the season that we're in in our culture, and uh, really for believers, is our song has been stolen. And if the enemy can get your song, then he can keep you bound. But I want you to think about Paul and Silas. Now is the time, church, to lift our song again. Now is the time to make sure you're a little bit early for church so that you can get in the room. Not because it's about a song. We sing a lot of songs I don't personally enjoy. But you know what I do enjoy? When the brethren gather together in unity and God commands a blessing, I'm like, where else would I wanna be on a Sunday morning? I'm dealing with some things in my life. I'd like to have hundreds of people around me saying it in the same praise to God, even if I don't necessarily care for the style of the song or the words of the song necessarily, I love the power of the song. And that's why in a minute here at Vacaville and all of our locations, we're gonna wrap this up by singing praise to God again. And I do believe that people are gonna be set free today. Chains are gonna be broken today because others are listening. 
Don't forget the other part of the story is Paul and Silas were singing hymns to God around midnight and the earthquake came and it shook the foundations of the prison and their prison door opened. That's not what it says. It said every prison door opened. Every chain was broken. Every bondage was broken because of the faith-filled praise of two guys. Here's the second point I want you to get. Your faith-filled praise doesn't just affect your world, but the world around you. It doesn't just affect your world, but the world around you. And I love this fact, too, that the jailer runs in, and he knew the punishment that he would get for letting prisoners go, uh, that would be worse than killing himself. And so he was ready to kill himself. But Paul said, hey, 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 don't do that. We're all here. How many of you guys know of a prison that if all the prison doors opened, everybody would stay? No. So what happened? Because of the power of praise, I believe suddenly the atmosphere inside the prison became better than the atmosphere outside the prison. Man, being in a prison season with Jesus is better than being outside without Jesus. His presence is everything. His presence is the answer. And I believe the jailer ran in. When he finally figured out that they were all there, he sensed something. See, the Bible says that God has put eternity in the hearts of men. And so I think, because if you read it, it says that he ran in. Paul said, we're all there. Don't kill yourself. And then he said, what do I have to do to be saved? Paul didn't preach the gospel. We have no scriptural evidence that anything took place between him running in and then saying, how can I be saved? So it's just my opinion, but I feel like it's pretty accurate, that the jailer sensed the same presence that all the prisoners did. When they said, that was supernatural what just happened, I want to hang out because I'm feeling something different. I think the jailer said, I I'm feeling like the thing I was created for. I I'm feeling, uh, this is obviously different because you guys all stayed here. I'm feeling the presence of Jesus. And so the jailer got saved, his whole household got saved, he brought them out and bandaged up their wounds, they all got baptized, amazing things happened. And church, I'm here to tell you that something happens when the people of God rise up even in the worst of situations and lift a song of praise. It changes your situation and it changes the atmosphere in the area around you. Yes, even of a city, yes, even of a state. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. So faith says when we sing together on a Sunday morning, could it be that our city is affected? And biblically we say yes, it's very true. When we come together and sing songs of faith together on a Sunday morning or a Thursday night, our state is affected. And biblically, that's accurate. Now is the time to sing praise to God because God changes the atmosphere around us. Church, it's, it's, this is the time to not be quiet. This message is really not about, you know, some good feels on a Sunday morning, although it feels good to be in the house of God at all of our campuses. It feels good to be in the house of God. But this is about eternity. Remember, life is short, eternity is real, and people matter most. So one of the greatest things that you can do is break chains over our society with faith-filled praise with faith-filled confession, with our prayers, with our worship, the weapons of our warfare are not, my, uh, not carnal, but they are mighty for the pulling down of strongholds. And so simply, here's what I want you to do to apply this message today. Praise him. Sing praise to God, speak praise to God, whisper praise to God. And in another situation that I was in, uh, just real briefly, because I, th I feel like you need it. People, when I told them when I was preaching on today, oh, you're gonna get your guitar, and we're gonna have those moments, I'm like, I'm not gonna play guitar. Because how many of you guys don't play guitar? Right? A lot of you. <laughs> so if this was about a guitar, that doesn't help you. But I remember a couple, even just recently, there was something going on in my body. I'll make this one brief, hopefully. <laughs> something was going on in my body. I went to the doctor to check it out. The doctor threw out, oh, I just want to make sure it's not, and it ended in OMA. And I'm like, I don't like words that end in OMA. <laughs> Cancer. And, uh, but I'm, you know, I don't know. We'll just see. Come back in a month. And I'm like, oh, thanks for that. So I remember that day, I'm like, oh, it's nothing. It's, you know, because of all the symptoms and all this stuff, it's nothing. And, uh, but about midnight, how many of you guys recognize it's always about midnight, <laughs> right? Thank God for the word of God, because that is accurate. You're good, and then you're laying there in bed going, I don't want my boys to have to figure out how to live life without their dad. Because this thing that I'm experiencing, there's multiple of them, you know, multiple symptoms, and if this does turn out to be what they're saying it might be, that's not good. And then all of a sudden, fear, torment. I didn't get up and grab my guitar and start, you know, 
shouting over my wife and you know that she would, <laughs> wouldn't appreciate that. But I literally just rolled over in bed and into my hands just start whispering, God, I exalt you. God, you're worthy. God, you have my life. God, I give you everything. God, you're powerful. God, you're my healer. You are Jehovah Rapha. You are my healer. And as I did that, Fear and torment start to lift. Why? Because praise is a choice. Praise is not something I wait for. Praise is something I do. Praise is not a song I sing. Praise is a weapon that I wield. Church, we got to get this today, and I'm excited for each and every one of you to step into another level. Maybe you've been serving God a long time, and you've dropped this weapon of your warfare. I'm telling you, pick it up again, because it is powerful for the demolishing of strongholds over your life and over those you're around. The band, you guys can join me on stage as we get ready to apply this, because again, I want you to get your faith up today. Nobody leave. We're going to lift up praise together and believe that God is going to break strongholds of, of, you know, chains over relationships, chains over your mind, mental torment. God's going to heal people today because it's who he is and it's what he does. But I want you to read this uh, on the screen, Psalm 150. I'll read it. You can read along. This is why the Psalms end like this. I'm convinced. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals, which is why it's loud at the Father's house, by the way. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So before we do this, I wanna tell you, in the morning, praise him. At night, praise him. It, when heaviness tries to come in, praise him. When fear tries to overwhelm, praise him. In your car, praise him. In your room, praise him. Wherever you are, let everything that have, has breath praise the Lord. Why? Because praise is powerful.